a man that is a representative of the European common market community, and I have had a close, long relationship with many people in the community. They've been in our office, and in our visits to Europe, I have visited with several of them. And we have here today the delegate from, as the first secretary of agriculture, the delegation of the Commission of the European Communities to, to our country here. And he has worked for the Commission of the European Communities in the following capacity since 1959. He was a junior official at the North American desk of External Relations Directorate, a member negotiating team in the Dillon Round. In 1963-1974, he was official in the Agricultural Directorate of the Commodity Divi Division, a member of the negotiating team of the Kennedy Round, and now as First Secretary of Agriculture of the Delegation of the Commission of the European Community. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Herman de Long uh, of the Common Market European uh, Commission. Mr. Staley, gentlemen, I just uh, came out of the plane, and in the meantime, I even lost my paper, so I speak uh, from the cuff. And I didn't have the time to, be, uh, to become sufficiently, say, familiar with your organization and with you all, so that perhaps if I raise some subjects which might, say, be less interesting for you and some subjects which might be a less, little bit less more, I hope that you will correct during the question time the subjects which you are especially interested in. Uh, I want to announce before I go on first about what subjects I would like to talk to you. Uh, when I got the invitation from your organization to speak here today, uh, I was told that I should especially uh, concentrate on the market possibilities in the European common market and uh, the conditions on which you can trade with us. But before I do so, I must, however, go a moment, and I hope you will be here with me for five minutes, go into the market organization in Europe, because if I don't, I can't almost not explain why in your trade relationship with us you are confronted with some very important obstacles for which there is not always the international understanding which you would like to see. Um, I don't want to go too much in historical detail, but you will all know that, of course, the nine European countries, originally six, have decided to put their uh, lot together and to form the European Economic Community. Now, in these uh, processes of integration, um, there was a special interest of getting a common market, as we say it, in the agricultural field. Now in Europe, in general, before the common market, there was a very elaborate system of national intervention, government intervention in agriculture. Why was this? Because, as you know, in Europe, the productive capacities in the productive uh, production uh, environment is not so efficient as in the United States and was not even so efficient as the industrial sector. So to keep, say, for social and economic and political reasons, the agricultural sector in line with the whole society, it was necessary in our different member countries to have some government assistance. This took a form of a wide variety of interventions, but generally it was mostly done either by a guaranteed minimum price for the main products, if you are talking in terms of grain, or by deficiency payments. Now, at the moment we wanted to form this agricultural common market we were put before the, cho the choice which form our support should take. And as I said to you, we had this choice between the guaranteed minimum price, price which is mostly then, of course, paid by the consumer, or the deficiency payment system through the government budget, finally also paid by the taxpayer and though by the consumer, but in a more indirect way. 
Now, with the population, the agricultural population in Europe at the time that we constructed this agricultural policy, which ran into the 20% in Italy, for example, and 15% in France, you will understand that it was almost impossible to accept or adopt the deficiency payment system for the simple reason that forming a common market meant also financial solidarity between the member states and it would have meant that for example a german taxpayer to choose that example would pay for a french producer and as there were many French producers, of course, this budgetary transfer and this payment by the German taxpayer would be so heavy that it would be a political impossible. So we choose the other method. And since 62, when the common agricultural policy began, we have put in the market a minimum price system for the main commodities. And especially, of course, for the basic commodities, for the grains. This minimum price system uh, consists of two elements, but I will concentrate on the what we call the intervention price, uh, which should be familiar to you in a certain sense. It is more or less, it has the function as your loan rate. Uh, we have also the possibility, is, as in your loan rate, uh, or say having a credit on the basis of your commodity in the loan rate system, or we have it buying directly by what we call the intervention in organism, which is say comparable to your CCC. And so our intervention mechanism has also the possibility to buy it. This system should of course be defended I put it a little bit in crude forms, but at least so we regarded it, against, say, the disruptive effects, price effects from the outside world market. And so we have as a corollary, as a corollary, and, and sort of a parallel mechanism, two typical instruments of our agricultural policy, which is one, the variable levy, and that's the point where most traders and indirectly you as a farmer are confronted with and secondly what we call the restitution and I generally don't use a more uh, general term for this because we in Europe we always think that our restitution is a very specific instrument but of course it is in its effect a subsidy. Now the variable levy guarantees or should guarantee that no quantity of grain is coming into the common market under the intervention price or say the European loan rate. And so we have fixed at the border what we call a threshold price which is comparable to the intervention price but only a little bit higher because there is a second principle in the common market that if we wanted to have a free flow of agricultural produce, we should also, because we had put together ourselves together, we should also guarantee that first the European product is internally sold between the member states. Ah, the papers are there, so during the question period we might use them. Good. So the. Um, there is uh, what we call then the community preference. So the protection at the border is a little bit higher than that minimum price system about which I talked to you. And you have, of course, as a foreign exporter to take that hurdle to compete with the European common market product. This should not avoid you to compete with other foreign countries suppliers to the community because the price difference which you might eventually succeed in uh, offering is of course because of the fact that this variable levy is non-discriminatory should of course be reflected in the same way once you have paid that levy. I forgot to tell you exactly how we calculate that levy. Uh, 
you understand already from what I described until now that the variable levy is the difference between the world market price and that minimum price internally. It varies because the world market price varies and it varies per year because the internal market price varies per year by a decision of our common market institutions. So as a foreign trader, you are primarily confronted with this variable levy. An, irritative, an irritation point, of course, for foreign suppliers because it's variable, as the name says, in nature. And you don't know exactly what you are going to pay on arrival in the common market. However, we have a system of prefixation which allows you at least to get that insecurity out of the uh, market expectations, so to a certain extent we accommodate it, of course, and to, uh, to get this uh, uncertain element out of the world market system. These days, there is a second element which uh, comes into play, uh, and that depends on to which member state of the community you are going to export. Since the monetary changes in the uh, well, since 71, they are 72, we had to maintain the same price level in the community for agricultural produce. And to be able to do this, we had to compensate at the border and in, in store establish certain taxes so that in the case of, say, a, a devaluation of the French franc, the French would not be able to profit, benefit purely on monetary grounds of the change in the system compared, for example, with a German, a German producer. So there are two elements these days, and we hope that once the monetary situation is, of course, a little bit cleared up, which is, of course, a totally different uh, subject and for which the outlook is at this moment not too bright, but that then, of course, this element will be eliminated, but today you are confronted with those two elements, the variable levy and the compensatory monetary amount. Now, this sounds all a little bit distressing and complicated, I suppose, for you, but the reality is, and that's where I would like to uh, speak in the second part of my uh, speech, the reality looks a little bit better than all this complicated stuff I just talked to you about. In fact, since, say, at least the last five years, the uh, American exports to the community have constantly grown. Uh, I might cite two or three figures. At, um, we, at this moment, export to the United States in agricultural produce, which are mostly uh, what we call transformed products, because we cannot compete for the basic foodstuffs, uh, more or less for one billion dollars. The United States, over the last three years, has risen from a level of 2.6 to, I think today, 5.6 billion dollars worth of primarily grains, soybeans, and the like. The deficit in the agricultural trade between the community and the United States is growing uh, to our disadvantage, to the community's disadvantage. Uh, this was already the case before last year, and so it can be considered a trend, and was particularly heavy this year because of the influence of the drought. Generally speaking, I would say that the outlook for the American exports to the community are what I would qualify as satisfactory. And I base this on three developments. Uh, in general, the uh, production growth for grains in the community is 2.5% per, per year. Um, the consumption is more or less, the growth is more or less of the same magnitude. So at least the same share of our market will be reserved for foreign suppliers. 
Uh, I uh, said already, and I want to repeat that, that of course, this year, uh, because of the drought, this share was, of course, uh, considerably raised. Generally, I would say that you would, at this time, have a share which would amount to in grains and soybeans together, because we always take them together, of around uh, 26 million tons. This year, we imported 30, 31, or we are going to import. That's the estimation. Um, the going into the different products, I would say that the chances for wheat are the least uh, advantageous, the outlook for wheat exports of the United States to the common market. Uh, as you know, uh, certainly, uh, Europe is rather se self-sufficient in wheat, but needs to import a certain quantity for quality reasons. Uh, we generally import between two and a half, three million tons. Uh, for this wheat, of course, uh, the United States has to compete with other suppliers, and in particular, Canada. Um, this year's crop, though in quantity, because of the drought, very low, was in quality rather good, and I expect that uh, there is a tendency to import a little bit less of quality wheat, because we, the quality of our own wheat is relatively well. We have developed in the community a sort of variety, a high yielding variety, which cannot uh, be used for uh, very well for bread and baking purposes. And um, it might be that we will in future use more of this high variety wheat for feed weeding, uh, for um, feeding for animals, for animal feeding. This may, in the first view, uh, look a threat to your corn exports, but we do not expect that your corn exports will go down. We foresee more that they will be stabilized. And I think that uh, there, for corn, you are in a very good position because you are almost the only supplier of corn in the world. To at least to the market, and I think that there is no, not the slightest worry you might have about your corn exports. On soybeans, that is always a little bit, a little bit more uh, confusing. Uh, for soybeans, we have not this nice system of variable levy, and so we cannot adapt, say, our internal uh, supply of uh, feedstuffs. Uh, in comprising the soybeans, because for soybeans the import into the community is entirely free without the variable levy, and uh, it is uh, purely competing, uh, of course, with the corn and with your corn export, for that matter, and with our feed wheat. We import generally in the neighborhood of uh, 8 to 10, no, we import 11 to 13 uh, no, a little bit less, I'm sorry, in the neighborhood of 10 million tons of soybeans. Uh, we um, had, of course, the experience uh, about which you are well aware and probably a little bit, uh, uh, what do you call that, a little bit embarrassed as well. We had, of course, the episode of the embargo, which uh, suddenly shocked Europe uh, very much because we are heavily dependent on your soybean uh, deliver supplies for our animal feeding. Uh, so sometimes there are rumors that uh, Europe might try to diversify its uh, origins of supply for the soybeans. Now, I must uh, say that uh, there may be some truth in that sort of uh, rumors, but in general, I would say that uh, we did not very well succeed in uh, diversifying this uh, origin of supply. And I foresee that uh, for soybeans at least, the United States can be re reasonably assured as well in the future. Of course, this year there is no problem for your soybeans, but in, in future as well, that Europe will remain one of the major clients for your soybeans and will at least import the quantities which we have imported until now which will situate around the 10 million tons figure. Uh, 
As far as outlook goes, uh, I have indicated, of course, already in quantitative terms, uh, there is, of course, uh, always the possibility that the negotiations which we are now engaging upon uh, on the in the multilateral trade negotiation in Geneva uh, might result in further access possibilities. Um, you know probably that uh, the community and the United States are uh, the main uh, opponents in uh, the discussion of how these uh, negotiations, especially in the agricultural field, uh, should be managed. Um, the community, as you understand from uh, what I told you in the beginning, is looking for a greater price stability in the mar world market. Uh, the United States is uh, especially concentrating on the access aspect, uh, the, the market access. Uh, both are discussing sometimes the very uh, speculative uh, item subject issue of the reserve stock. Uh, I know that this is a uh, subject, an issue which is much discussed now these times as well in the United States, and it was in fact in the uh, election campaign. There are, a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of schools which, uh, on the one hand, see uh, the uh, especially the uh, depressive, uh, the depressive aspects of a reserve stock. Uh, there is another school who sees especially the uh, food security aspects of a reserve stock. But uh, that is all very doctrinal. Uh, it is clear that uh, you will have uh, next year a considerable carryover already in wheat. And uh, reserve stock or no reserve stock, it's clear that you will have a reserve. Now, the, uh, then the problem becomes uh, of another nature, uh, we would rethink in Europe. Once that this has been, uh, res this reserve is already virtually there, is it better to uh, uh, make uh, some very strict rules to uh, get some of the depressive aspects of a reserve uh, out of the way? And we think that uh, the stricter the rules are for st storaging and uh, destocking of such reserves, uh, the least the chances are that there will indeed be a depressive impact. Uh, if there are no rules, the depressive impact uh, is certainly there. So Europe is trying to uh, defend the idea of an international reserve of national stocks uh, tied up to a sort of price mechanism. Uh, at this stage, I don't know what uh, the uh, attitude of a new administration will be. I think that uh, your organization, uh, like others, will certainly uh, contribute a lot to such a discussion and to uh, this a whole way of thinking in a new administration, but it is clear that uh, I think today uh, there is more willingness on the part of the United States government, and I suppose it reflects then uh, also the attitude as in an organization like yours, to at least have a serious look upon uh, such a mechanism and to try to put some more stability in the international market. Uh, I would think that with, say, the relative big carryover of next year, it would be to the advantage also of you as a producer and a trader uh, to have more stability in the market, in the international market, because otherwise, uh, well, chances are, I don't want to use that word, and you have avoided that during now four or five years, but otherwise chances are, of course, that some subsidization may also take place for the American products, and then we will again be in a sort of financial budgetary competition, which it's not sound for any of us. On finally, I would like to, and that is of course because uh, I'm here as well in sort of official function, I must however, I must precise a certain warning. The warning being that uh, within the multilateral negotiations or without in our bilateral relationship between the United States and the community. Uh, we uh, are very much aware in the European community, of course, of this big deficit to which I, which I was pointing out before. We agree that uh, certainly the United States has a competitive ad comparable advantage, comparative advantage for uh, grains and such as such we uh, I think on the European side, there is not uh, 
great uh, willingness say, to produce more and so reduce your share of our market. But uh, politically and financially and in our bilateral relationship, it will be necessary that uh, we will find some outlets for, for some of our agricultural products as well on your market. And I must say that the experiences of the last two years uh, were not very happy. I came here uh, a year and a half ago. I fell in what we call one conflict to another. Uh, you will certainly have read in the press uh, about uh, our exports of cheese to the United States, our exports of canned ham. Uh, you have now on a governmental level a sort of reglementation for wine. Uh, these are all cases where, say, Europe is, has a certain comparable advantage, on comparative advantage, and we would like, instead of reducing, uh, raising, at least in those sectors, or, uh, our exports to the United States in a moderate way, but at least that they would grow. Well, in the framework of the actual uh, instruments which your uh, government has uh, got in the form of the trade tax, in the form of countervailing duties and, uh, and the like, uh, at the moment the trend is uh, completely inverse. Uh, actions have been taken uh, or s under which we had to reduce uh, the exports to the United States. And, uh, we are a little bit worried about the whole climate in the agricultural trade. The, the, the latest event being, of course, and that is always for politicians a nice subject, uh, the uh, renewal again of the poultry, what we call the poultry war. Uh, personally, I must say that though I uh, uh, see the, uh, what we call then the implications of this uh, uh, poultry issue in our relationship, I find it always a little bit exaggerated because uh, poultry exports to the community are in the neighborhood uh, from the United States of uh, 15 million uh, dollars. And I told you already that the global exports in agriculture from the United States to the community are 5.6 billion. So it uh, must be considered a relatively small item. But in the political world, and it's, it has become a problem. and. It has been between us a problem, uh, I think, already now for 10 years. And it seems that politicians uh, always have a fixation point once they have understood a problem quite well. They have a tendency to concentrate on that problem. I think uh, we should concentrate more on, our, on the grain trade and from our side more on some of the dairy products and of the, uh, well, in, in our case, the canned ham and the wine. Well, I hope that in this uh, small introduction I have uh, given you some uh, orientations for further question, uh, questioning. I must say that uh, I'm, uh, I am, of course, very happy to be here. I never was in Milwaukee. I had some excellent uh, German beer and German food, and I certainly plan to come back. And I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Uh, he would answer a couple, three questions if somebody has a question they like to ask. Ivan Borden from uh, Warren County, Ohio. I understand, uh, it's my understanding that you are working for or employed by uh, the community on government level. Is that true? Yes. I am um, I'm of nationality a Dutchman. But I am uh, an uh, official of the common market institution in Brussels. It, it, the headquarters are in Brussels, uh, which, of course, is the uh, official organization for nine member countries. I, I, I can cite them if you want. To, uh, fine. England, Italy, uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, Denmark, Ireland, and I forget one. Mm -hmm. Germany. Oh, I forget Germany, of course. Yeah. Yes, and, I'll, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm here one and a half year now. We have a small delegation in Washington mm -hmm. because, uh, as I told you, the 
In the agricultural field in particular, uh, we have a common policy, a general policy for all the nine, and it, it was found uh, necessary at a certain moment that there would be one small delegation who can present to the American government mm -hmm. the opinion of the nine together and not individual as member countries. <coughs> Your um, problems in agriculture seem uh, very similar to the problems we have here. And, uh, I wonder, a uh, question that arises in my mind, who are you representing? Are you representing, uh, um, I, I know, I'm understanding you're representing government in general, the, the common market government, the Department of Agriculture. Yes. But if you um, are a representative like someone here would be a representative of the American Department of Agriculture, that does not ne necessarily mean that you are representing the interests of the family farmer. And uh, my question is, whose interests are you representing? The interests of big business or the interests of family farmers? Uh. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you, we have, we think, but we are so much criticized for it, we have developed in Europe an agricultural policy which is orientated, destined for the average family farm. That's the model. Now that implies in Europe, because the farm size is relatively small and we have still a very great, too big, but of course the actual uh, economy is not the moment to change that too quickly, too big the farm population. And this, that, that's why we have a policy which is relatively protective and relatively social in its nature. Now generally, and that's why perhaps we didn't understand each other or my tonality was not right or, or, or I'm probably already a little bit deformed by I'm in the United States, we are attacked by the United States on the fact that this policy is so protective and keeps in life an agricultural produce which is not considered in American eyes not completely competitive. And so the insistence from the American side is exactly to get this protection and this support to the family farm down. So if you ask me what I represent, I would say that I represent the family farm interest. Okay, could I? I would, I would like to comment on that. Um, I don't really, uh, I hope to um, gracefully disagree with you, you know. Uh, I think that your policy as a Department of Agriculture, if I may call it that, uh, representing the common market is, uh, pretty much in line with the policy of the American Department of Agriculture, uh, meaning that the farms are too small, and that the farmers have, and that we have too many farmers still. We do so in the United States, we still have too many farmers, that is, according to uh, agriculture or uh, Department of Agriculture policy. And I see that uh, the policy of the Department of Agriculture in Europe is uh, a carbon copy of the, of the same policy in, in America. The farms are too small, there are too many farmers, and I think that uh, your policy in Europe seems to be protective of the family farm because you can only take one step at a time, uh, reducing the number of farmers and enlarging the size of the in individual farms. And I think that's the only reason why you seem to be protective of family farms. Um, the trend should be, if you're truly representing the family farmer, you should um, want to see more farmers and smaller farmers. And that's what we want to have here, and that's what we are fighting. And I think that uh, the European farmers, of which I'm, uh, you know, I'm from your country, you know, I'm your countryman, and my family which I visit every now and then, they're all farmers, and I understand 
farmers there, and they grab just about as much about farm policy as we do here. And I think it's it's all just about the farmers have the same interest, and the Department of Agriculture have the same interest. I think that might be pretty well universal, you know, and I think they're uh, very much in uh, uh, um, opposite when it comes to interest. And I will answer you. Eh? But in the first place, uh, let me one moment uh, leave those comparisons between the U.S. and the community departments of agriculture out of the way. Eh? We had, we have more or less the same population in the United States in the community. Eh? You have uh, 235, we have 250, I think. Eh? We had, when the common market began, 17 and a half million farmers. We have today nine. If I am well informed in the United States, 4% of the, less than that, I think that your farm population is more or less half of what it is in the community. So, we are not in the same stage. In, there is some talk in Europe in the framework of the agricultural policy whether we should encourage more people to leave or whether we should keep them as you want or even you want to raise it. In Europe there is of course no question to raise it. We have still 9 million people. But that we should slow down these people leaving the farm because of for all sorts of reasons. Eh? Not only f say for political stability, not to get to big cities, to keep the farmland going, to keep, say, well, uh, let me say the things as they are, generally farm population is much more stable than, of course, a city population. So there are many reasons for which in Europe we would like, and we, there is talk about that, we would like to keep the situation as it is. But there are still very great problems in some sectors. And our problem sector is the dairy sector. Uh, we must sanitize the dairy sector. We have a lot of small-time farmers in the dairy sector who cannot make a living from that. And we can never support that because that would mean such a high level that could not be defended in the total uh, equilibrium of the uh, repartition of the budget. We must, and there are a lot of part-time farmers in the dairy sector, so we must, at least in that sector, s what do we call sanitize the situation. The people who have a part-time activity in dairy we feel should leave that uh, activity because they are producing the oversupply, which costs lots. It, costs, it will cost this year one and a half billion dollars to keep all that horrible non-fed dry milk which we have accumulated in the community going. So y you understand, I mean, I agree with your argument that there is a case to be made to keep the fa family farm going. There is a case to be made to uh, what do you call encourage that. But nevertheless, we have to make quite important uh, corrections, and that will mean, in the especially in the European dairy sector, a reduction. Yes, that must still be done. I think these are very good questions, and I, I want to say this in an understanding here, and the reason our relations have always been good with the European common market people, and we have kept close contact with them, and those that have tried to tear down, and I'd like for him to listen here because he's well aware of this, those that would tear down the uh, levy system would have torn down the family type farm in the European area. And that is the protection they have, and our position has been with them in our conversations with them that we hope to express now greater and more firmly that you don't fight the, the levy system in the common market countries because that is the protection for the family type farms. And if you tore down that barrier, that would be tearing down another barrier of reasonable farm prices somewhere in the world. And this is a big segment of the world. And that's the reason that we have the understanding that we've had with the European common market people and not usually looked upon uh, very favorably with the people representing the U.S. foreign policy. I've had some pretty good debates on this issue. And he's very careful here to not be in conflict with our people here, and I'm not going to say more than what I've said here, but I think he mentioned an international food reserve that they're talking about, and this is some of the things 
that I think that we can work together with the, with the countries throughout the world that we're going to have to negotiate some minimum prices throughout international contracts with enough teeth to protect it at a, re at a reasonable level. They wouldn't have to have a levy system, right? That's the answer to it. And that's the answer of helping to protect here. And with that, we're going to have to face a very dire political situation throughout the world that the people that have the food, unless we can work out a way to get the food and get something in return, and much of it will have to be barter, uh, the third world countries, we're going to have political explosions in those countries if we cannot keep pace with other countries throughout the world and the European common market countries are very, very important in this type of negotiations. Did I? Do you agree? All right. Thank you. I didn't want to speak something that he didn't want to say, but I could say it. Maybe he could. talk in behalf of his company as an individual from one of the largest Japanese companies which we have with Wolf Grundy who's had long experience in contact with him who is now assisting us who did one time and then left and is back uh, home again I guess in the NFO. Uh, Wolf Grundy stand up Wolf. Uh, he uh, he went to uh, <laughs> He's happy to be back home. He just, uh, he and Fred uh, was with us, on the, uh, with me on the second trip to Europe. And he was born in Germany. He speaks German and it came in very, very handy. Uh, particularly when we went behind uh, uh, the wall in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we did make uh, quite, a, uh, quite a thing and we will try to report that a little tonight as for a moment to give you a brief summary of those. But uh, the gentleman that I'm going to introduce to you is a, a gentleman that I've known several people in his company. It's one of the largest of the Japanese companies, and uh, he is here today to speak to you about the Japanese market and whatever else he may want to say. It's Norman Ohashi, Assistant General Manager of the Agri uh, Agricultural Products Department of Mitsui and Company. Uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy and also very much honored to be might here. Go, might go just a little closer. Just Thank you. Stand a little closer. Thank here. you. Okay. With you today at such a famous NFO annual convention. I am not a government official, and uh, just from the viewpoint of a member of a private company, I would like to brief you on the Japanese food situation and the U.S.-Japan grain trade relationship here today. I want to start by looking at Japanese food production. We have farmland about 6 million hectares, which is about 1% of that of the United States. And also, farm population is 6 million, which represents about 5% of the total population of Japan. In Japan, farmers are growing several types of grains oil seeds and pulses, but rice is a prime item to represent Japanese agriculture from several viewpoints. National demand of rice is about 12 million tons per year, which 
represents about 70% of the total demand for all food grains in Japan. The demand for rice stays constant, although population is increasing at the rate of 1.1% annually, per capita consumption is relatively declining, thereby offsetting any possible demand increase. On the other hand, rice production will also remain stable at around 12 million tons from the rice land of about 3 million hectares. There are two basic reasons of stable consumption of rice. First reason is that rice is supported by the government with a price formula that adjusts according to the cost of production. Second reason is that farming methods, including the use of better seed, breeding, application of chemicals, and mechanization have improved considerably. This year, rice production in the northeastern section of Japan was adversely affected by cold weather and total production was a little lower than 11 million tons. But there is still no particular need for any imports because we have about 2.5 million tons of carryover from last year. I want to move to the next item of wheat. Wheat is the second important food grain in Japan. Wheat consumption has increased rapidly due to the U.S. food aid program established after the World War II and the government school luncheon programs which provide bread for school children. Today, wheat is an important part of the Japanese diet with six million tons being consumed each year. Further major increases in demand of wheat are very unlikely, however. That demand should remain steady as per capita intake of starchy foods declines as in the case of rice. While demand for wheat has increased dramatically, production of wheat has declined drastically. As the increase in farm income lagged behind that of industrial income, farmers shifted production to rice, which is supported at high prices and abandoned wheat production. Many farmers went to the cities to get part-time jobs. Recently, the government has encouraged wheat production by paying farmers a subsidy. This is preventing further erosion of production, but it has not helped increase production on a large scale. Japan, therefore, depends on wheat imports for 95% of its total supply, which has now stabilized at about 5.7 million tons annually under government purchase systems. Many varieties of wheat are being imported 
to fill this need. They are used in a number of different products. For instance, Japan has recently imported 1.5 million tons of Canadian wheat for bread and 1.1 million tons of Australian wheat for noodles. Japanese imports of 3.1 million tons of U.S. wheat is broken down as around 1.2 million tons of soft wheat, 600,000 tons of semi-hard wheat, and 1.3 million tons of high-protein wheat. As a result of this diversity, some of the large Japanese flour mills are selling flour under more than 500 different brands. The average Japanese tastes are complex, and we are lucky to be able to import these many different varieties of wheat. Next item is barley. Barley situation is very similar to the case of wheat. We are consuming about 1.8 million tons of barley annually for malting, staple, and feed. About 90% of demand should be covered by imported barley, which is also controlled by the Japanese government. We are importing barley from Canada, Australia, and the United States. Corn and milo are other grains which we must import. Neither of these grains are grown in Japan, yet they are important sources of feed for hogs and poultry. These are becoming even more popular in the Japanese diet, and the average fa family enjoys a higher standard of living made possible by the country's rapid economic growth. Along with these factors, the decreasing catch of our coastal fishing has brought a boom to the livestock industry. However, cattle raising is very difficult in Japan. We have limited areas of grassland for grazing, and except for famous, very expensive Kobe beef, most of our beef comes from dairy steers. We once experimented with beef cattle raising by feeding calves shipped by air or sea from the United States or Australia. The result was not favorable due to high mortality in transit, the lack of quarantine facilities at destination, and the weight loss caused by frequent transportation. With reasons mentioned in the difficulty in beef production, Farmers are concentrated on the production of hogs, broilers, and eggs. As a result, production of these three items made rapid increases, and in 1975, we had 1 million 20,000 tons of pork, 600,000 tons of broilers, and 1,800,000 tons of eggs. This represents 90%, 96%, and 98% respectively of the total demand. Demand for these products is projected to increase at a rate of 3% per year for quite some time. And so, will continue to utilize more corn and more milo. During July 
in 1975 and June 1976, Japan imported 7,880,000 tons of corn and 3,770,000 tons of milo for a total of 11,650,000 tons. As import quantities for these commodities continue to rise, it is projected to, to reach a total of 16 million tons by 1985, which is roughly an increase of 140%. Japan buys corn from the United States, Thailand, and South Africa, and Milo from the United States, Australia, and Argentina. Again, the United States is the largest supplier with a 70 to 80 percent of share in the Japanese market. For your guidance, Japanese mixed feed production in 1975-76 was 17.2 million tons, which was 10 percent higher than previous year. And we are estimating this year's production roughly 18.5%, which is 7.5% higher than last year. Next item is soybeans. Almost all 3 million tons of soybeans used in soy meal are also imported from the United States. Some soybeans were bought from Brazil for shipment this year, but I estimate the quantity at no more than 150,000 tons. Japanese oil crushers don't put priority on the Brazilian beans because red soil adheres to them and causes processing problems. And also, it contains more foreign materials than the United States soybeans. For the reasons I have outlined, US-Japan agricultural trade, particularly in food, has made great progress in the last 20 years from the $370 million in 1956 to $3.3 billion in 1976. The increase has been tenfold. One very important factor in the U.S.-Japan agricultural trade relationship is stability and predictability. In other words, there is no violent fluctuation in volume for Japanese purchases as opposed to the demand from Russia, which can show big ups and downs depending on the year. The fact that the constant quantity is sold by the USA and bought by Japan means that both U.S. farmers and Japanese consumers can depend on each other with confidence. I hope this relationship will continue for our mutual benefit. I want to express my wishes on grain trade, namely that stable supply with stable price. We need food every day. It is the most important material in our lives. Because of this, the nation which is self-sufficient in producing its own food supply is fortunate indeed. The citizens of such nations are free from the worries 
of food import being interrupted by wars, strikes, big crop failures in producing countries, and lack of foreign exchange. They don't have to speculate on what to do if world food prices advance astronomically and there is not enough money to buy necessary food supply. In the other words, a stable supply and the maintenance of stable market prices are two very important things which all importing countries wish for. Several steps have been taken to stabilize supply and demand. Bilateral arrangements such as the US-Japan agreement and the US-Russia grain agreement are good examples. I'm sure the future will see many similar agreements. If, however, these agreements were not limited to the relationship of two countries, if they could be expanded to multinational relationships such as the former International Wheat Agreement, they could make a tremendous contribution to world food distribution stability. In addition, I think that importing countries should have some reserves for self-protection. Beginning this year, Japan started building reserves with the initial modest quantity of 50,000 tons of soybeans and 60,000 tons of corn and milo and 250,000 tons of feed barley. The Japanese government is also encouraging industries to build silos to store grain by extending loans and subsidizing interest costs for their construction. However, it is very difficult and uneconomical to hold large reserves in a country like Japan where the cost of acquiring and maintaining land is very high. It would be preferable if the reserves were held in the producing countries too. International reserve program should also be studied to stabilize world food supply and demand situation. Price, <coughs> excuse me, price fluctuations in farm prices are legitimate market functions as long as demands are adjusted through its mechanism. But fluctuations should be limited to an extent which allows growers to plant for the next year and also allows consumers such as manufacturers, livestock farmers, and housewives to make reasonable plans both in business and in household. Such fluctuations should not be mere tool for speculators' games. In closing, I would like to say that I hope we can continue to work together in harmony and for mutual benefit in achieving stability in food, we can help bringing world peace and confidence to everyday life. Thank you. Thank you both of the guest speakers and we will not have any questions here. Uh,